that's me on the left. Take note of the bike on the right. You're going to see that again in a little while. So here's proof that I graduated off the stabilizers. The same year Han Solo introduced himself as the captain of the Millennium Falcon. Don't laugh, that's a good look. And to prove it, here's a picture of Harrison Ford on a girl's bike. Oh, there's that bike again. Handed down from my older brother. Until that is one Christmas, when my dad presented me with this year's big present. A home-built bike. Basically a Frankenstein job. Parts he'd collected over many years. Painstakingly polished, put together, secretly, in the garage. And here I am, aged nine, staring at what can only be described as the first mountain bike in the UK. And I soon became the envy of all my ratty grifter, boxer and chopper riding mates. We called it the Comet. Twenty years later, I got my first full suspension mountain bike with money my nan had saved for many years. This introduced me to a whole new world. And I wonder if these 20 year cycles are not a coincidence. Because this year, in 2022, I bought myself my first e-bike. £4,400 is a lot of money, isn't it? I mean, that's a Volkswagen Polo, a thousand pints of beer, 10 OLED TVs. So why buy an e-bike? And is it worth that amount of money? Well, I felt inclined to try and answer that question, having just taken the plunge myself and purchased a specialised Tero 4.0 EQ e-bike. So having recently got a job four miles from home and having watched the e-bike market explode during the coronavirus pandemic, I thought now's my moment to purchase a new bike. Now obviously I considered getting an EMTB, but I wasn't quite ready to replace that hobby with an e-bike. Now my last full suspension bike, another specialised stunt jumper, comp, carbon, 29 inch wheels, I've had for eight years and it's been a really good fun bike to own not least because of the lightweight so why would I go and purchase a bike that is almost 25 kilograms in weight well let's find out so obviously I tried a fair few e-bikes I went into many a shop I spoke to some young whippersnappers as well as some seasoned sales staff and I must say that I found they all talked utter bollocks. But of course listening to these salespeople you can only do for so long. What you really want to do is jump on the bike and take it out for a proper hard ride. The problem is I live on the border of two of the flattest counties in the UK so my idea of taking a test ride is hitting asphalt and trying to cycle over speed bump as fast as I can, just trying to get air, and then maybe cycling up a hill, which even a snail would probably find amusing. I fell back upon the Specialised for two reasons. Firstly, they have refined their e-bikes over a longer period than most, and produce, possibly, the best EMTB on the market, the Turbo Levo. And secondly, my go-to store treat their customers with an element of respect. I learned about the Terro through this store while I was actually inquiring about the Vardo. The Terro, I was told, would allow me to commute by road during the week 
and continue to enjoy my trails at the weekend. As it goes, my commute actually takes me through a woodland. So I was sold. The Tarot comes in three different versions. The Turbo Tarot 3, the Turbo Tarot 4, and the Turbo Tero 5. These differ in terms of motor power, battery capacity and components. The Tero markets itself as a do-all mountain bike, trekking, commuting and single track. However, it's worth noting, a full suspension, chuck it down a mountain, it is not. This was the weekend riding I was more used to, and to justify the readies, I would have to sell my carbon fibre 29er and thus a certain style of riding for a whole new experience. I went for the Tero 4 EQ. This comes with a specialised 2.0 250 watt 70 newton metre motor. So generally the more torque a bike has the less work you have to do and that is very watered down because it's quite a science to actually understand torque but we're not going to go there. So my 70 newton meters will allow me to get up to 15 and a half miles per hour at a fairly good pace. Now, like most EU countries, we are restricted to the 15 and a half miles per hour limit, which is a bit of a shame. I'm not quite sure how they managed to get to that speed, but it does mean that you don't need insurance and you don't need a license to ride one. But don't be taking it down the motorway. That's not a good idea. So I'm going to rattle through the standard equipment. But uh, for those of you who really want to geek out properly on the equipment, uh, please check out electricbikereview.com's YouTube video on the Specialized Turbo Tero 4.0 EQ. It really is uh, an in-depth, overview of this bike and all the components and the way it is presented and articulated um, I couldn't I couldn't even come close so ultimately the standard equipment for the 4.0 consists of the following UI remote mastermind TCD with handlebar remote built-in anti-theft feature Bluetooth connectivity customizable display pages battery Specialised U2 710 alloy casing, state of charge display 710 watt hours. Brakes, SRAM guide T, four piston caliper hydraulic disc, cassette, SRAM PG 1130, 11 speed, 11 to 42 tooth, front forks 110 millimetres with low speed compression and lockout and preload. The EQ stands for equipped, which means it comes with some extra components. And because I'm going to be commuting in all weathers, these were an attractive feature to me. So let's have a rundown of those components. Headlight, Lezine E-Bike Mini STVZO E65, 210 lumen, 12 volts. Tail light, Spanning A Commuter Glow XE 12 volt. Kickstand, specialized kickstand, 40 millimeter mount. Rack, specialized rack, MIK HD interface, built in pannier mounts, 27 kilograms max load. Fenders, specialized dry tech fenders, 65 millimeter width, alloy fender stays. Bell, simple bell. I like that. Fenders, mug guards to you and me. I've already commuted back in a storm. I turned the lights on. I didn't get hit by cars. Visibility was very, very low. I still got absolutely soaked, but I didn't get any crap in my eyes and that was important. I got home safely and I lived to tell the tale. Now this is one solid bike, 25 kilograms to be exact and my elderly neighbour described it as beefy. 
I've nicknamed it the Pterosaurus. It is heavy, as you will see from the videos, me lifting it onto the bike rack. I do not want to flip this. I do not want this landing on top of me. Of course, a lot of this weight is battery. 3.8 kilograms, in fact. Talking of which, let me show you just how easy it is to remove and to reinsert. So you've got a key that goes into the frame and then there's a lever that you pull. And as you pull the lever, it releases the battery, which is on a hooking mechanism inside the frame. So charging off bike is very straightforward. It's like charging a MacBook. It's got a magnetic cable and once you get it the correct way round, it will engage onto the battery and you can turn it on and charge. It takes a few hours to fully charge, I'm guessing about six hours, so it's best you just leave it on overnight. And my test range gave me 58 miles, that's 94 kilometers, in trail mode. So I'm guessing that if you reduce the output using the keypad down to, say, eco mode or 50% mode, then you're going to get about 80 miles out of a fully charged battery which is pretty good. However, in the app, you've got a great little feature which allows you to input your mileage so you can actually tell it how far you're going and how much you want left when you return. So I could say I'm going out for a 50 mile ride and I want 10% left in my battery and it will adjust the output to the motor accordingly and ensure that you have 10% left when you return, which is a pretty good little feature I think. Just a word on those handlebars, here's a clip of me taking it out of the shed. You're going to have to negotiate the wide handle grips through narrow doors and gates. You can make adjustments to custom fit your ride. Most of the components can be very easily moved using a small allen key. Handle grips, brake gear levers, remote and the dropper lever. Now this saddle is definitely worth mentioning. It is the most comfortable saddle I've ever ridden. Um, I've absolutely no idea how they have come up with a design that does not give me any kind of pain. Riding trails, bumping up and down on ruts would normally cause me pain particularly after riding for a few hours which I've done today I have absolutely zero pain in my backside today so to turn on your system you just press and hold this button here you see the specialized logo and it goes into trail mode automatically you can change the modes by using this remote here so plus and minus, up and down, will take you to turbo mode, or down will take you to eco mode. And obviously there are a few other screens which will show you various statistics and pieces of information. You also have this button underneath which halves your power. I must say I love this display. High definition bright and fully functional. All controlled using the handlebar remote system. I won't go into too much detail on the different pages and statistics this can provide. However, there are some highlights. The power modes, pages and preferences are all customizable. For instance, I prefer to see things in Imperial, specifically miles per hour. I can create new pages to focus on very specific stats. I could create a page to show me just the three speed metrics. Speed, average speed and max speed. You can retune the support and peak power for each mode or add your own preset. If you want to get really geeky, under the diagnose screen is a lot more information on the state of the battery in the motor 
such as firmware and temperature. If you're a Strava user, you can automatically upload your rides. And a great feature is that you can adjust which rides get uploaded based on distance. So, for instance, I don't wish to upload my daily commutes to and from the office. So I only upload rides over five miles in length. Just a word on powering on your TCD and the lights. I believe some countries require all bikes to have lights on, even during the day. And as such, some hardware engineer at Specialized was asked to ensure the lights turn on when powering up. Even though you can turn them off by holding the F1 button, I find this a minor annoyance. Now, the gears. They're going to be used a lot on this bike. Remember, you're accelerating faster than normal, and as such, you'll be constantly knocking them up and knocking them down, that chain set. So, to help determine the right cadence and to avoid unnecessary motor strain, you have a very useful cadence counter, depicted by a sliding bar. If your gear is too high, the bar will be on the left and show as red. Too low a gear, then the bar will show on the right and red. Keep it in the middle and you're in the best gear. The thought and the UX on this complete system is brilliant. So I'm just coming to the top of a hill here which uh, I often run down and uh, I know for a fact it's about four miles door to door or uh, should I say door to uh, peak Although it's not much of a peak here in Essex, it's all fairly flat, but um, I'd normally be puffing away at this point and um, I wouldn't normally be riding with one hand either, but uh, I just wanted to show you how effortless this uh, pedalling is. You have three standard modes, each offering a different amount of support and peak power. The higher the mode, the faster you'll be reaching that 15 and a half miles per hour limit. So what happens when you go beyond that 15 and a half miles per hour limit? Well, this depends on whether you're going uphill, downhill or flat. Going uphill, you will know you have a 25 kilogram bike underneath you. It's tough and you will need to ask yourself, are you out for fitness or leisure? On the flat, you'll probably be sitting just above the 15 and a half miles per hour limit. I average about 16 and a half. And as such, the power only kicks in when I fall below the limit. However, downhill is where those 29 inch wheels really perform. Top gear will easily get you up to 30 miles per hour. But don't go thinking you can chase motorbikes. <laughs> open road like this the 15 and a half miles per hour limit can seem a little restrictive at times and you feel yourself pushing past it and that's where the fitness comes in that's where e-bikers aren't cheating and then when I'm lucky hit a very steep hill. Even at 34 miles per hour it was still, still too slow for the car behind me. Well, that was fast for a bike. an example of uh, the speed that you can get up to unassisted on a nice flat tarmac. I'm doing 18 and a half miles per hour at the moment and uh, it's really easy. The 
the e-bike gives you extra energy. So there's less consideration over food and water and fatigue. There's a comfort there, a comfort to rely on the motor to get you home. I'd normally get anxious over meal times or losing light or incoming bad weather. Should I be heading home? The comfort allows you to go that much further out for longer. So, what's it like off-road? Pretty good. Generally, it is a very sturdy and capable bike off-road. The thick, knobbly tyres give confidence on loose and dry surfaces such as gravel or shale, and uphill will feel quite exhilarating. The fenders, if you've gone for equipped, will keep any flying debris away from your face, and those front forks will do a great job of absorbing the bumps. However, there are a few niggles that are worth mentioning. Firstly, it can get very bumpy, a lot more than my other hardtail. The saddle does its best to absorb the ruts and the potholes, but you're going to be thrown around off that seat quite a lot. I notice this more when urban riding, generally because on the trails I'm more prepared. I think it's something to do with the weight on those thick tyres, so it is bouncing more abruptly. Now, those thick knobbly tyres, useful as they are, they have a habit of picking up sticks, like a dog, and passing them through the fenders, occasionally getting jammed at the top, which makes for a very noisy ride. If you're lucky, they'll be spat out somewhere on the trail, but on a couple of occasions I've had to stop and retrieve the sticks from the jaws of my pterosaurus puppy. It also does this with stones, and you will often hear them shooting through the fenders. I wonder if this can be resolved with a smaller gap between the fender and the tyre, or changing the tyre completely. Because of the noise, there's no stealthy riding, and I often ride through woodland, and I love getting close to and watching the deer. The noise from the motor and the fenders give them plenty of warning. That said, I discovered that by turning the motor off completely, it makes for a much quieter ride. And to be honest, even with the extra effort, this slowing process and extra effort adds to the e-bike experience. I like the fact that you're reminded of the weight and power of the motor. And with deer stalking complete, you can switch back on and continue. I've also found that when those big tires hit a deep rut, the momentum of the heavier bike will abruptly throw you off the saddle. And if you're not careful, off the bike completely. Right, so the test. A mile and a half uphill on an e-bike, unpowered compared to an e-bike powered and my old carbon fiber 29er. Now this is gonna be fun, because my old carbon fiber 29er is a very light and quick bike, and I want it to be as fast as the e-bike. So let's see the results of that. The reason why I chose uphill was because that's where the e-bike really comes into its own. That's where it really eats the speed. Downhill, you can get up to 30 miles per hour. I've actually got up to 40 miles per hour which is pretty scary, I must admit. But uphill, this is where you need that e-bike power. So let's see how they fare.
Okay, so this is time trial two, going uphill, a mile and a half, on the e-bike, with no power. So I'm just turning the power off now. Starting off with first gear. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. We're going up that hill, mile and a half, in trail mode on the e-bike. So I guess there's a cynical part of me that suggests that because I've already invested 4,400 quid in this thing, I am going to want to justify the investment by suggesting to you that it was worth doing. But I promise you I haven't had any regrets yet. Is my £4,400 worth it? Well, I tell you what, the kit alone on this bike is really good. The rack, the fenders excellent pieces of kit, lights, great motor, great battery, easy to charge, solid, good, fun bike. Yes, definitely worth the 4,400 notes. So why buy an e-bike? Well, here are some good reasons. You can increase your riding distance. You can get much, much further out without the panic of not having enough water or food. You can arrive back home or at your place of work, sweat and smell free. You can replace short car journeys and it's the way to go. But importantly, they really are good fun. I've seen you. Hey.
Because 